so today, we're going to continue our series called Tribe. And for those of you that weren't here last week, we talked about how we're all a part of at least one tribe. Most of you are a part of more than one tribe. You've got your, your family, that's one tribe. You've got the people that you work with, that's another tribe. Or the people you go to school with, that's another tribe. And, and, and the tribe that you identify the most with, the one that you have your strongest connection with, will tend to affect how you relate to your other, other tribal relationships. If your family is your strongest tribe, you'll tend to make decisions that most preserve the health of your family relationships rather than giving in to other tribes that will try to pull you away and vice versa. Whichever is the strongest tribe in your life is the one that will define who you are and the kind of decisions that you make. And so it's so important as we, as we take a look at, at the tribe that Jesus is putting together, the call of Christ upon people to be able to follow him. And God has been putting a tribe together for a long time. And, and, and it's within the tribe that God calls together that God does his greatest miracles. I don't know if you realize this, but when you read the scriptures, and oftentimes it's talking to you and you and you, the way that we often read the scriptures, we go, oh, that applies to me. But it's not applying to you as an individual. God often is addressing things to you as a tribe, to us as a community. And the commandments and the, and the directions that God gives were meant for a people to move together. And it's within the context of a people that are willing to move together that God does his greatest miracles. We're going to see that today. And today I'm going to talk with you. It's kind of a, kind of a us deal today. I want to talk with you about, about us as a church, about where we are, about who we are, and about where we're going and how God is leading us. And we're going to take a look at it in the context of, of Joshua, who one morning must have woken up and thought, holy smokes, what am I going to do? Because he found out that Moses was dead. God made it very clear. You go to the beginning of the book of Joshua, and it says, Moses, my servant, is dead. Bottom line, Joshua. Joshua's freaking out. So God said, be strong and courageous. Be strong and very courageous. Go back and read that chapter. Why did God have to tell him that? Because he was afraid, that's why. Because Moses was the greatest leader that the nation had ever seen. And he's like, how can I do what Moses did? He's the one that led the nation out of slavery. He's the one that, that through whom God parted the Red Sea. We saw miracles happen through him. Who am I? God says, you're up to bat, buddy. It's your turn. And, and, and as God began to lead Joshua, there were defining moments as, as God was kind of giving them a, a tribal identity. Same thing that he does with us. And so in Joshua chapter 3, it says, Early the next morning, Joshua and all the Israelites left Acacia Grove and arrived at the banks of the Jordan River where they camped before crossing. Three days later, the Israelite officers went through the camp giving these instructions to the people. When you see the Levitical priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, move out from your positions and follow them. Now time out for a second. So the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, uh, since many of you get your primary education through movies, <laughs> think Raiders of the Lost Ark. You want to know what the Ark of the Covenant was? That big gold box with the angels on top and the wings pointing forward because that box represented God's relationship with the people of Israel. And it was through the Ark of the Covenant that God, even though he is everywhere, chose to localize his presence in a very different, unique way. And this thing was, was where God had chosen to reveal himself, and not just anybody could like go and carry this, this ark. You had to be a Levitical priest, and you had to use a pole, and you couldn't touch it, because if you touched it, zzzt, you were done, cooked, toast. Why? Because it represented the holiness of God. It was so holy. And so it makes sense what, how he gives these next instructions. He says, he said, uh, when you see the Levitical priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, move out from your positions and follow them. Now, check this out. Since you have never traveled this way before, they will guide you. Some of you are in that place today. You're, you're, you're in a place where you go, I've never traveled this way before. Where I'm going, I've never had to do this before. I, I don't have any experience in this. So since you've never traveled this way before, they will guide you. 
with the presence of God. And I love this. Stay about a half mile behind them, keeping a clear distance between you and the ark. Make sure you don't come any closer. And, and it's an important picture because if the ark of the covenant were right in front of the people, only the people in the front row would be able to see it. But by having the Ark of the Covenant a half mile, it was for everybody to get their eyes focused on the presence of God. It's to keep their eyes focused on him. And, and, and I love the picture there because, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a nearness that Jesus has brought us into in a relationship with God. There's a nearness. He, he's our Savior. He's, he's, he, he's revealed God as Abba, Father, Daddy. And there's that nearness part. But we also have to remember that there's also an awe. There's a reverence that you have to keep with God. That he, he never becomes so familiar to us that we just treat him lightly. But that there is a, there's an awe. And so they were close enough to God to know I'm in relationship with him, but they were far enough away to revere him and to go, he is God and he is holy. And I think that's a great picture of our relationship with him. And so what kind of context does God look for? What kind of tribe does God create where he could do miracles, where he could do the most powerful things? Here's the first thing. It's a tribe that trusts God to lead where we've never gone before. To lead where we've never gone before. I love last weekend. Last weekend, man, at Coquina Beach, 32 people making decisions. Yeah. <laughs> to go public... With the idea, God, I'm, I'm walking with you, and, and you lead. Hey, guys, for those of you that didn't see it, here's a, here's a great video of it. So how about you? What is it that God's leading you into? You know, it, to be able to trust God when you've been always having somebody in your life and, and some of you are going into a season where you're going to be alone. Are you going to be okay with that? Will you let God lead you there? Some of you have never let God kind of help you to grow. You've been kind of like a lone ranger. God's saying, no, get into a small group. It's okay. And, and it's in a small group that you grow. For some of you, you've never learned to trust God in the area of your finances. He's saying, tithe. Take a step. Watch what I do. And, and, and a willingness, when, when God finds a tribe who has the willingness to let God lead, when you trust God that much, then you have the context where God can do powerful things in your life. And it's so important that, that we as a people do this. Let me, let me tell you where we're at today. Let me tell you where, about where we are as a church. So we're in the midst of a lot of transition right now as a church. we got a lot of transition ahead of us. We're kind of in a reorganization time. You know, Pastor Jason, who, uh, who moved to be closer to family, uh, was our student pastor. Um, he's, he's made that, uh, they've made that move. Uh, we've got, uh, right after kids camp, uh, Russ and Millie, who have been an important part of children's ministry, as well as Luis and Rachel. Uh, Russ and Millie, we love you guys. They're going to be moving to New York. Uh, Louis and Rachel, they're going to be moving to Massachusetts. They've been a key part of children's ministry. 
Uh, Pastor Nathan, who has been our worship leader, will continue to be involved with worship, but God has called him to be a part of partnering with pastors that are planting churches to help their their churches gain traction early on. And, And God is taking all the influence and all the experience that Pastor Nathan has had and expanding that in a huge way. And so he's gonna go in a part time basis here. And you go, holy smokes, what is happening? What are we gonna do? You know what we're gonna do? We're gonna follow God and we're gonna trust God like we always have. We're gonna, that's what we're gonna do. And we're gonna say, God, you reshape us. You lead us. We've never been in this kind of, uh, of situation before. We've never had that. But you know what we do? We bless the calling of God upon Russ and Millie, upon Luis and Rachel, upon Pastor. We bless that. Bless God's calling upon uh, Pastor Jason. We bless that and we say, God, we've never been in a situation like this. But just like you did when we became the bridge 10 years ago and we didn't know all that we were going to be, we're going to trust you and we're going to keep our eyes on you, God. And we're going to do that together. And it's so important because that, that, that for the leaders, notice they had the Levitical priests that were a part of this. And, and, and it's so important that we as leaders are walking by faith. Because how can I as a pastor ask you to live your life by faith if I'm not walking it myself? And how can we do this without trustees that walk by faith, without small group leaders who are going, hey, man, I've never learned to lead before, not like this, but, man, I'm going to trust you, God. And, and everybody that is in a small group then learns to take steps of faith because the leaders are, and the leaders because the leaders uh, on our level, on staff level, are doing the same thing. We all have to do it. And God can do amazing things through a community of people where it is a tribe that trusts God to lead where we've never gone before. And that's what we're doing. We're going to follow him. Look at what Joshua says in verse 5. It says, then Joshua told the people, purify yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do great wonders among you. Let's say that together. Purify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will gr- do great wonders among you. Purify yourself. This is an identity thing. When you say, hey, what kind of tribe can God do something powerful with? It is a tribe where the people set themselves apart for a divine purpose. It is a tribe of people who say, I'm not here by accident. I'm not just here to exist. God created me for a divine purpose. Do you believe that you were created for a divine purpose? Do you believe that God put you in your school, in your work, that God put you in your neighborhood, that God put you where you are because he has a divine purpose for you? The the truth is, is he does. He wants you not only to know him, not only to find freedom, he wants you to discover your purpose and to make a difference in the world. But the key is this, it's a tribal thing. And see, what we have to do is we have to be people who see ourselves as being called to a divine purpose from God. It's like this. The the Bible says, think of yourself as a vessel. And, And when you're a vessel and you have purified yourself, when you're a clean vessel, God can pour something beautiful, powerful, and amazing in you. And God can pour that through you into the lives of other people. The nation of Israel was called to reveal who God is. In the same way, those that claim to be followers of Christ, our primary mission is to help people see who God is. And what the scripture says is God always looks for people who have made the decision that they are a vessel for God, that they realize that they have a divine purpose, and so they purify themselves. And guys, let's just be honest. That means that there's some stuff in your life that shouldn't be in your life. It just means that, that anything that comes into your heart, whether it, it fuels attitudes towards women that objectifies women, whether, whether it fuels anger and bitterness and hatred, whether it's social media where you're posting about your boss, you're, it's, it just shouldn't be a part of it. Why? Because you realize, man, I have a divine purpose. I can't just say what I want to say. I can't just think what I want to think. No, I, want, I don't want to miss out on what God wants to do through me. I want to have the kind of heart that I'm so in tune with the voice of God that any prompting God gives me, I can do it. That God will, God will fulfill his purposes in my life because I've decided that I am a vessel for God. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to purify myself because I want God to do something great. And see, this is a tribal decision too, not just an individual one. 
And so here's what we're going to do. I can tell you that, that in order to help us to be able to do this, there's two things I'm going to institute. It's one thing twice a year. August and January. Every August, every January from this point forward, we're going to have a period of 21 days of fasting and prayer as a church. We're going to do that together. Now, here's the thing. Some of you are freaking out like, I can't eat for 21 days. I'll teach you. I'll teach you. Okay? Why are we going to do that? Man, because what God can do through a tribe that sees themselves as having a divine purpose in the community. What God can do through us when we set ourselves apart and we say, God, I want you to do great things in my life and I don't want to miss it. Man, that's an amazing, powerful thing. Because here's the deal, guys. Church is not about Sunday. I don't want to be a Sunday church. You know what kind of church, you know what kind of tribe we need to be? Not just a Sunday tribe, but a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday tribe. And this becomes just the huddle, just the rah-rah for what God's going to do through you on Monday when you go to work or when you go to school. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So that the community is impacted by a tribe of people who have declared, I'm purifying myself because I am a vessel of the true and living God. And I don't want to miss out on the miracle that God is about to do. So he says, purify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do great wonders among you. We're not going to miss out on that. Here's what he goes on to say. It says, in the morning Joshua said to the priests, lift up the Ark of the Covenant and lead the people across the river. And so they started out and went ahead of the people. The Lord told Joshua, Today I will begin to make you a great leader in the eyes of all the Israelites. Make you a great leader all by yourself? No, here's how he becomes great. They will know that I am what? With you. That's what's going to make you great. Joshua, they're going to know you're great because they'll know that I'm with you just as I was with Moses. Give this command to the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant. When you reach the banks of the Jordan River, take a few steps into the river and stop there, which Joshua might have been thinking, no, 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 that's not the way it's supposed to work. I saw this. You're supposed to give me a stick. I raise it up like Moses. You part it. Don't make us walk in there. And God's saying, no, 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 no. You see, see, you're not going to ride on Moses' faith. I've got your own faith story that I'm building. And I'm going to work through you as I work through Moses. And you know when God is calling you into something because it feels like, but I've never done this before. It's like, yeah, that's right. You, you go ahead and you take those steps. And check this out. It says, so, so, Moses, so, so Joshua told the Israelites, come and listen to what the Lord your God says. Today you will know that the living God is among you. He will surely drive out the Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, Girgashites, Amorites, Jebusites, and please drive out the termites too, God. We would really appreciate that. Let's pray right now. Come on. Look, the Ark of the Covenant, which belongs to the Lord of the whole earth, will lead you across the Jordan River. Now choose 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. The priests will carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth. And as soon as their feet touch the water, the flow of water will be cut off upstream and the river will stand up like a wall. So the people left their camp to cross the Jordan. And the priests who were carrying the ark of the covenant went ahead of them. It was the harvest season, and the Jordan was overflowing its banks. It was that flood stage. So this isn't like just an old oh, nice little creek. This is going to be the miracle of the creek, right? No, this is like flood stage. But as soon, as soon as the feet of the priests who were carrying the ark touched the water at the river's edge, the water at that point began backing up to a, a great distance away at a town called a dam, which is by, why we call them dams, because of this dad joke, boom. <laughs> which is near Zarethan, and the water below that point flowed onto the Dead Sea until the riverbed was dry. Then all the people crossed over near the town of Jericho. 
Meanwhile, the priests who were carrying the Ark of the Lord's Covenant stood on dry ground in the middle of the riverbed as the people, what? Passed by. They waited there until the whole nation of Israel had crossed the Jordan on dry ground. What kind of context is God looking to do great things? Not only is it a tribe that trusts God, not only is it a tribe where the people have set themselves apart for a divine purpose, but it is a tribe where each one is taking steps of faith to make God known. Each one. And, and, and the people that would go into the Jordan when it was dry, I guarantee you they weren't the same person that set foot on the bank on the other side. They just walked through something that they saw God do that was life-changing. And here's the deal, for a tribe where God could do powerful things to take place, for a tribe to exist like that, that means that everybody sees themselves as part of that tribe, that everybody sees themselves as, I need to take the step of faith that God is calling me to take. Because this is who we are. This is what it means to be a community of faith, to walk by faith. And here's the deal, your obedience during the flood stage of the situation that you're facing determines the depth of your faith. Your obedience during flood stage of your situation determines the depth of your, of your faith. It's not when things are going well, oh, it's really shallow, we're just going to you know, dance across this puddle. No, it's what you do when the waters are deep. And it's your willingness to obey God and walk by faith in that that reveals the depth of your faith. And God is looking for a tribe where people are just living in that whole kingdom faith kind of a thing. Let me just give you a couple examples. So recently, we were able to give away two cars. You know, we tell people all the time, don't trade your cars in. Uh, just give them to the church. We always have people that are looking for cars. Let me just tell you two recent stories. So in one of them, uh, a young lady is getting out of uh, her uh, life where she's really making her way back, connecting with God. We saw her engage, uh, really beginning to thrive. And, and, but part of the things that was holding her back was just a transportation issue. And she had a conversation with her mom just the night before and said, and her mom said, you know, you just got to trust God with these things. Let's trust God with this. The very next day, we made a phone call to this young lady. We didn't know about the conversation that had taken place the night before. We said, hey, we want you to go ahead and take a look at this vehicle. She looked at the vehicle, and she's like, why? We said, because we think you're supposed to have it. Let me tell you, it was a game changer for her. She's dancing around in the office, and everything's going crazy with this. Let me tell you another one. Same type of setup, except in this one, it's a mom who, the, where the dad had just abandoned the family. The mom's working three jobs to try to make ends meet for her and her son. And, 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 and she falls asleep behind the wheel because she's working so much. She collides with a police car when she's asleep. So she got all these tickets. Uh, her car was totaled. She's taking a city bus trying to keep things going. Had a conversation, we were having a conversation, with, with, and, and, and the conversation was like this, boy, a car would be a game changer for that woman. You know, we need to trust God for a car. The very next day was a Sunday. I'm standing here. Someone comes up to me and goes, hey, do you know anybody that needs a car because I've got one to give? <laughs> Telling you. How does stuff like that happen where people embrace a faith where they say, God is my provider. God, God is generous to me. I can be generous. I'm living in his kingdom now. There's something that happens when people take steps of faith. Let me give you another example. So uh, Katie Albrin, who we just love. Katie, when she first came to us, uh, this is what she looked like. You'll understand why she was wearing that halo, which, by the way, is a fixture because her neck had been broken. Here's her story. Take a look. Hey, my name is Katie. I am 29 years old. I grew up in Bradenton all my life. I started using marijuana when I was 14, and then it slowly, by the time I was 17, it was full-blown into uh, cocaine, marijuana, partying every night. At that point, I had no reason to change. I was just living life. And um, so I thought by having, finding out I was pregnant and having a child, it would change things for, for my life. I was 23 when I got pregnant. I was scared. I was nervous, I was happy. By then I was already taking pills. 
it started going to the, um, they called them the pill mills. Life became a little unmanageable at that point. He was a year old when, um, when I got caught using, I was intoxicated with him and uh, DCF came in. Um, when I got out of prison, I had no hope of ever seeing him or getting him back. I was on the streets two years after I got out of prison. I didn't have nowhere to go, nowhere to stay. I just lived from one place to another. November 10th, 2014, um, I had walked into a trap house. I had just stolen a whole bunch of money from a guy and walked in there, was going to buy drugs. Well, as I was in there, I pulled out the wad of money and that's when um, somebody had hit me upside the back of my neck, broke my neck. They left me in a ditch down the road. I woke up in the hospital with a broken neck and um, I had a slight infection in my heart. And um, that is when I knew something had to change or I was gonna be dead. And then um, I had reached out to Tom and Tracy at his girls. His girls was amazing. I always, I always knew people cared, but not like how Tom and Tracy have put their whole life into his girls. You know, while being his girls, I learned how to cope with the I have sisters and people from the church that are there to walk beside me and help me get through them, other than going to find some type of high that's only gonna last for a couple hours to to numb the pain. I hadn't had my son in over four years due to my drug addiction and um, so when after I went to his girls and started putting in the footwork to change my life, um, his father started seeing the change in me and started um, allowing me to see him little by little and coming down and visiting while I was in the program. Just recently he's been back down here with me and full time. So. That's a huge, huge thing for his dad to see the change and allow me to have him. I can't even explain the feeling that I have having my son back in my life. It's just amazing. It's awesome. Like, I wouldn't change it for the world now. I always knew God, but not the way on the level I do now. And if it wasn't because of his girls, I wouldn't have that relationship I have with Christ. That's the kind of power we're talking about that will transform lives. And guys, this is, this is who we are. We're a tribe following Jesus Christ, keeping our eyes on him. We're a tribe that's setting ourselves apart to be a part of what it is that God wants to do in our community. It's who we are, and that's where we're going. We're going to keep our eyes on him. Guys, I want you to be a part of that. And so here's what I'm going to ask. What is the step of faith that God has been putting on your heart? For some of you, it's surrendering your life to this Jesus and trusting in his power to absolutely transform your life. He's available for you. He died on the cross to pay for your sins. He wants to forgive your sins. He wants to come into your life with the power of his Holy Spirit and transform you from the inside out. It's got to be him and he'll do it for you. For some of you, it's, it's, it's stepping up, beginning to lead, lead in a small group, begin to make a difference, help other people to learn the path. You've gotta follow. For some of you, it's even joining a small group, being willing to, to open up your life and to be a part of, of learning how to grow in a community and become part of a tribe. For some of you, it's trusting God in your finances. If you haven't started tithing, tithe. If you tithe and it's like second nature to you, express generosity over and above that. Just let God continue to grow you in faith. Don't stop. Whatever that step is for you, take it. And this is who we are. And this is what it means to be followers of Jesus Christ. God's going to ask you to close your eyes. Father, thank you for your grace. 
And Lord God, may you continue to move in every heart. Thank you, God, that you are building a tribe, a tribe of people, Lord, who are following you wholeheartedly, who have their eyes fixed upon you, a tribe of people who say, I don't want to miss what it is that you're doing, God, and you can count me in. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take my steps. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to purify myself. I'm going to let you purify me by the work of your Holy Spirit. And God, may you be glorified in our community as you continue to knit us together as a tribe focused completely on what it is that you want to do. We love you, God, and we thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Hey, guys, give it up for God.